common sense in current times. Uh, today I get to speak with um, Dr. William Mackis, and Dr. Mackis has a fascinating story that, he, that, that he's going to tell you, to talk to you about uh, not only his, his uh, moving as a refugee from Czechoslovakia to Canada, to then battling the Canadian government long before COVID, long before the COVID restrictions and, and, and what was happening there. And then just ultimately not only getting canceled, but losing his medical license, losing his reputation in a lot of different ways because he's saying, hey, there's some other issues that we need to be looking at. And I can't wait to you hear his story and kind of understand it because he talks also about you know, kind of the, the, the struggles he had and, and understand how to get past it emotionally. But in addition to it, he also talks about what his recommendations are, you know, for the, the, the problems that, that, that he is seeing in the world due to uh, the COVID vaccine, especially in relation to cancer. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to Uncommon Sense in Current Times. Um, today, when we're kind of looking at our world and looking at what's going on. There's just so much craziness that's going on. And uh, we just don't seem to know what's happening, don't know who to listen to, who to believe. Uh, and today I get to talk with Dr. William Mackis, who is a, a, an expert uh, from, from Canada of, of, of cancer. And um, he's gone through a whole lot of trials in the last several years um, uh, and, and dealing with, with, dealing with uh, either its cancel culture or with the government. And uh, so, Dr. Mack, I'd like to, to welcome you on the, the, the show, and um, i just like to know more about yourself. Like, kind of tell me a little bit about your history and, and kind of how you got here. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm a Canadian physician. I currently live in Edmonton, Alberta. I was born in Czechoslovakia, and I actually fled communism in 1988 with my family. <clears throat> we fled through... Um, through a neighboring country, Yugoslavia, because that, that was the only way you could go uh, and, and flee communism. If you wanted to flee your country, you would try to go to a neighboring country and then go to the United Nations, you know, and, and try to apply for refugee status. And that's exactly what we did. We went to Yugoslavia, applied for refugee status. Now, this was before Yugoslavia was bombed by NATO forces and, you know, before the war, just before the war broke out. And I lived in a refugee camp for one year. Uh, United Nations refugee camp. And, uh, you know, there were people fleeing from communist Romania, communist Bulgaria, uh, Russia, Poland. Uh, there were kids that were born in a refugee camp. People had lived in the refugee camp for many years, sometimes five, up to five years. Uh, we were there for one year. My dad was a, um, a math professor, and so he had skills that Canada wanted. Uh, so Canada gave us the, the permission to, to come, come to Canada. And so we came to Toronto in 1989. Uh, I learned English in the refugee camp. I started uh, school in Canada. And I grew up in Toronto. I did uh, all my schooling in uh, Toronto. I have an undergraduate degree, four-year degree in immunology. That's an honors bachelor. I then have a four-year medical degree from McGill University in Montreal and a five-year medical specialization in nuclear medicine, radiology, and oncology and I started practicing as a physician in Canada in 2010, and so I've been uh, I've been a Canadian uh, physician, staff physician for the last 13 years. Um, I practiced in a small town in Manitoba. Then I spent um, I spent three years there, and then I moved to Alberta to work at a large cancer center. Uh, and I worked on cutting edge cancer diagnostics and treatments. I published extensively internationally. I diagnosed tens of thousands of cancer patients. I treated hundreds of cancer patients. And then I ran into corruption in Canada's healthcare system. My cancer program was sabotaged illegally. Uh, and, um, you know, I was first offered a $400,000 payoff to sign non-disclosure agreements and leave Alberta. And I refused. And within six hours, my medical license was taken hostage by provincial authorities who then wanted me to sign all kinds of documents Um again, non-disclosure documents, and I refused. And so they've been holding my license hostage ever since. And that that all happened be before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, um, and the same individuals who sabotaged my cancer program were running the pandemic and were blocking COVID patients from being treated, were blocking ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine in lockstep with, you know, these globalist institutions like WHO and WEF. And... Um, 
you know, they were basically uh, killing COVID patients. They were putting patients on hospital protocols, remdesivir, uh, putting them on ventilators, killing them that way, killing them in, in long-term care settings. Uh, and and people um, got to see the corruption. Uh, I think the entire population got to see the corruption firsthand, the persecution of Christian pastors during the lockdowns, for example, um, you know, which made us a laughing stock of the entire world. And then, of course, the COVID vaccines they rolled out, which they are now giving to pregnant women and babies as young as six months old and, and killing, you know, hundreds of kids that way. So, um, you know, I got a really, uh, I would say, a, a, a PhD. Uh, I don't have a PhD, but I do have a PhD in corruption in Canadian healthcare system. I, 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 that, so I'm curious, when when you say the Canadian healthcare system, the corruption within it, was, is it, is it, was it rooted kind of more locally in Alberta or was it, uh, or was it across the board um, everywhere? Uh, I mean, how, where was that? The reason why I asked that question is, is I have a friend of mine um, who's has a Christian school in Alberta and the Alberta government was constantly going after them. And I know Alberta is where a lot of the Christian pastors that you referenced were also being, uh, being attacked. And so I was just curious to know, was it, is it specific to Alberta in the United States? It's like California seems to be more of our, our, um, uh, dictatorial type state, whereas, you know, a place like Tennessee, where I live, it's not as bad. So is it that way there in Canada or or was it more of a national setting? No. So actually, Alberta is uh, Canada's most conservative province. Really? Which is, I think, why. They not went... Ontario. I thought no. Ontario would be. Oh, wow. Not, okay. not even close. Not even close. It's when you look at the federal election, um, you know, there's been elections now that Trudeau's won, where the Conservative Party gets hundred percent of the of the seats in Alberta, and Liberals don't get a single one, and then Trudeau wins because he gets all of his votes in Ontario and Quebec, and so so it's a Conservative province. Um, but the irony is that healthcare is also provincially run. However, the bureaucracy that runs healthcare in Alberta and in other provinces has has is 100% loyal to the federal government. So you don't make it to the top of the bureaucracy whether it's healthcare or education in Alberta unless you are 100% loyal to Justin Trudeau, unless you're a liberal hardcore liberal supporter, uh you you donate money to the liberal party and and, and so it's really the public sector that is owned by Justin Trudeau and his liberals. In every province, regardless of of what the leanings, political leanings of the province may be, the bureaucrats are loyal to the federal government, and and that is that is actually one of the big problems that that we've run into because Alberta, the the pandemic response in Alberta, <clears throat> you know, I always said we might as well have had Justin Trudeau uh, running our provincial pandemic response because we had zero independence; it was all driven from Ottawa. And as we know, Ottawa has no independence. Ottawa, it was driven 100% through the WHO and the World Health Organization and the WEF. Uh, you know, I think even even very recently, Justin Trudeau has talked about running again on mandatory COVID vaccinations. This was just a few months ago. It was put on the on the website of, of the Liberal Party that they want to run. Um, I guess the elections are going to be in 2024 or 2025, and they want to run on mandatory COVID vaccinations. And, you know, Trudeau was uh, trying to launch a pilot program for um, some kind of a digital ID or vaccine passport uh, if you were going to fly. And so, you know, they're doing this in collaboration with Air Canada, trying to get a pilot program going for some kind of a, a vaccine passport to, to travel. And as we know, we had, we had actually travel restrictions. We had an iron curtain in Canada where 6 million unvaccinated Canadians were not allowed to set foot on a plane, couldn't set foot on a train. And this was for travel within Canada. All you could do was drive to places. And of course, the U.S. border was closed, as you're right. right. The, US, right. the U.S. border you know, was only recently reopened. So we were literally prisoners in our own country. Um, you know, I was telling my wife that we're going to have to get human traffickers to smuggle us into the United States or Mexico uh, to get out of the country, which is ironic because I came as an as a, as a refugee right. to Canada to escape communism, and now I'm looking for ways to escape communism from Canada. So it, it came around for cir full circle. Just just be careful if you do get smuggled out. Just be careful what part of the country, the United States, that you end up That's in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so I now 
I'm I'm curious because there's a couple couple things. So when I started kind of researching re- researching you and trying to kind of understand, and and I'm and I'm I'm not I don't have any medical background. I have very little. My most of it is is that when I did practice law, we did have some medical malpractice cases. So I kind of learned how to kind of read enough to pretend like I knew what I was doing, but but in reality, is I know I don't. And so when I was when I was reading about you, there's a lot of things online about you that you know that you're. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have skills. You had your license taken away. You're a quack. I mean, I'm all, basically, all stuff, I am, yeah. I'm painted as a complete lunatic. You know, I skate. It's, it's like I escaped from a mental asylum and I'm <laughs> like, you know, running around uh, screaming in the wilderness, making stuff up. And, you know, I mean, I think, I think I've been smeared probably more than any other Canadian doctor. And that's because I have ongoing legal, I have ongoing lawsuits. And um, the only leverage that uh, the bureaucracy that came after me, uh, the only leverage that they had left, and really the only leverage that the Trudeau government has left on me, because they they took my license, they took my hospital privileges, they took my job, was they want to make me unemployable in in, in the entire world. And, and they've come out openly and they said, we're going to wage a war of attrition against you and your family until you break. And we'll, we we're going to make sure you can't practice medicine anywhere else in the world. And And, and so you know, their playbook um, is to smear you. And, and, and so they've, they've smeared me, they've smeared my reputation. And, and you know, they've put all, all of these things online, everything is made up. And uh, it, it's a way to try to break me, break me financially. I've had my bank accounts raided by Revenue Canada. I've, I've been I've been declared deceased by my bank. They oh, raided my they raided my bank accounts and then declared me deceased. And and my wife gets an email from you know one of these um, insurance companies and saying, well, can we have Dr. Marcus's death certificate because we need to oh, issue yeah. some something? And she's like, you know, what are you talking about? It's like my bank had me declared deceased. Uh, so you know they they've done all kinds of stuff um, to try to break me. And 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 the reputation smearing is a big part of it. Well, okay, so so. And I want to kind of go into some of the stuff that that you talked about with 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 COVID and kind of the science of course, part yeah. about it. I do want to talk about that, but but I but I got to ask for from somebody who's had nowhere near the level that you've had. But I've had um, you know social media campaigns against me or my restaurants or or whatever. There's an emotional toil that takes on you, particularly, and I think from a man because you want to still be able to provide for your family. You still right. want to you know you want to protect. Like I want to protect my wife, who's reading all these nasty comments about me, and she's hurt because she loves me. But and I want to protect her from it, but not want to. I mean, there's that that struggle. How did you, how did you deal with that part of it? And especially, I mean, being a scientist, you're very much of you're more of a probably more of a practical thinker than a than an emotional one. Um, yeah. So how, how did you handle that? How did you deal with that during that moment? Those moments. You know, I can tell you. Um, I mean, I was very naive. To, to corruption in, in the Canadian uh, healthcare system and really Canadian legal system because it's gotten to the point where they're openly bribing judges to commit fraud in court, to issue fraudulent court decisions with court costs that then they're using to extort me with. But I was naive, you know, I, and, and I believed that there were mechanisms in place that would either protect me or that would um, deal with some of the attacks that I was... Um, uh, dealing with. So in the first couple of years, now I've been dealing with this since, you know, the beginning of 2016. So I'd say in 2016 and 17, that was, um, that was where my learning curve was the steepest. And, and I had to, I mean, I burned through my entire life savings on legal fees, because I got top lawyers to go after uh, uh, what is basically a $23 billion a year healthcare system, Alberta Health Services. They take twenty three billion dollars from the provincial government every year, and it's a black it's a it's a black hole. They take the money and and basically they never speak to the politicians again. Uh, it's it's almost independently run of the government, and so I was up against uh, I was up against an entity that had unlimited resources, and I did everything possible. I filed every possible complaint. I pursued every non judicial proceeding available to me, all kinds of administrative, you know, right. proceedings, tribunals, and so on. And then, of course, I went to the courts, I fought in courts. So I, I really waged a, a very strong legal battle for two, three years. That took a, a very serious, you know, toll, physically, emotionally, and so on. But I adjusted. And, and you know, I've, I've, had, a, I've had a business for 20 years. 
Uh, I am um, an, a numismatist, so I collect in, uh, old coins. Um, so I had a business in numismatics uh, that was uh, paying the bills. And um, so there was really no danger of me going under financially because, I mean, that's the way that they really wanted to break me. And so then really what they were left with was the reputation smears, which, again, I had to get I had to get used to it. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's difficult to to get used. You know, when you go from being a uh, a scientist, you know, with an MD, over 100 publications internationally, you know, well respected. I had two academic uh, appointments at the University of Alberta. I was assistant professor in Department of Radiology, Department of Oncology. I had a I had a huge cancer practice. I ran one of the largest clinical trials in North America for cutting edge cancer treatments. We were curing end stage cancer. To go from that to being basically a painted as a lunatic, um, and, and not not even a scientist, because you know because when they took my license hostage, what they do now is they smear me online and they say you're not a real doctor because you don't have a license because we took right. your permit hostage. So now uh, we've basically broken that, um, you know, your credentials. We've broken your credentials. Just, just the way they're going after Dr. McCullough and trying to strip him of his credentials. You know, they were attacking my credentials and saying, you're not a real doctor anymore because we took your license, which, again, has nothing to do with my training or my experience. It's a permit, you know, to work. And that, that's all it is. Um, you have to get you. You have to. I think you have to accept it you have to accept um you have to mentally accept that you know if this is my destiny and this is my path in life then so be it i have to embrace it you know i i can't uh play a victim or i can't i can't feel like i'm a victim even though i was and my family was victimized i cannot um sort of embrace that victim mentality, I have to just fight through and accept that this is my path, this is my destiny. And I think once you accept that, it, it's a lot easier mentally. And so I can tell you when the pandemic hit, it was a huge relief for me. Uh, and and actually, we, we felt like so relieved and we're like, oh, thank God, you know, now everyone gets a taste of the corruption in healthcare. And everyone was attacked by the same people that attacked me. And, and, you know, people had their loved ones attacked. Uh, they couldn't visit their loved ones in, 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 in the long-term care homes, or they couldn't visit their loved ones in the hospital, or they were faced with a choice. Do you take the jab uh, uh, to keep your job, or are you going to be fired and, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to travel? You're not going to be able to go to the restaurants. Uh, people were hit with those difficult choices and those hard choices, which, you know, we had to make years ago as a family. So for us, the pandemic has been a complete breeze. Uh, but but it's been like, um, you know, it, it's it's basically everyone else got a taste of that abuse and corruption that exists um, in the public sector, in the political sector, in the healthcare sector that was always underneath the surface. But people never had to deal with it because most people were never abused by the system, but they were abused by the system once the pandemic hit. Are you, you know, you, you, you indicated a lot of the fraud that you found in the courts, particularly early on, but, but you also indicated that you're still currently in the process of, of using legal means in order to vindicate yourself or at least kind of restore, restore some of what you lost. Uh, but if the court system is fraudulent like that, why are you, it seems like you're just throwing good money after bad. I mean, it just, uh, you know, or, or is it kind of just a range of it? Is there like maybe... Again, at the province provincial level, it's a little bit different. I mean, I'm just curious what, what you're thinking there. Well, I've been self-represented since 2018. Oh, wow. And, okay. And so I've been I do my I do all my legal paperwork. So basically, it costs me the cost of paper and maybe the occasional printer and printer cartridges that I have to buy. And no, but I really I've done probably millions of dollars worth of of legal paperwork filings, um, because the other side has spent millions of dollars uh on legal fees trying to destroy me uh, i mean i've been to court over 20 times i've had to face you know over a dozen judges over sort of you know the different court proceedings and i've done everything myself legally and and and, and that really is the only way to go because lawyers are expensive right you know, i mean i'm looking at um uh, what is it 500 four five hundred dollars an hour uh and then usually you know, the lawyer will bring in his partner or, or he'll bring in some junior lawyer. And, and so now you've got, you know, two or three lawyers who are charging, you know, four or five hundred bucks an hour. And then, of course, any proceeding that you go into, any court application, 
has to have affidavits and has to have, you know, uh, all kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, additional paperwork filed. And, and so that costs a lot of money each time. And what they've done is, uh, so, so I've basically, I've fought them to a stalemate. And that's where we're at right now is that we have waged a war. Like I have waged a war against the health authorities. I have, and, I, and I, we've waged it to a stalemate where there's basically, you know, I've got open legal proceedings, but every time I try to move forward, they'll file something to try to stall it. And I've come to the realization that, you know, basically the only solution for me is a political solution. Uh, and that's if, if a government comes in that is courageous enough to try to tackle the corruption, then they can use my legal proceedings against the existing bureaucracy. And that's happening to some degree. Um, so, uh, I see a lot of promise in that, but what was unfortunate for me was that, um, the, the bureaucrats, the healthcare bureaucrats I was up against, they ended up pushing an, an international agenda. And, and so they had support, they had international support. I mean, this is a mafia that, you know, it, 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 it starts off as a local mafia, but when this, when this, um, and they, they basically function like, like an organized crime ring. But because the pandemic was an international event and and the health authorities were going in lockstep with international organizations, they got the kind of support that they could tell the premier of Alberta to fuck off. Uh, they were that powerful. And um, so the Alberta Health Services, for example, which is this $23 billion a year health authority that runs healthcare in Alberta for a province of 4 million people, they literally signed a deal with the World Economic Forum in 2020. They announced it in the summer of 2020. They signed a deal, a multi-billion dollar deal, with the World Economic Forum for access to funds, access to cutting edge te technologies in healthcare, uh, and that basically they would be reshaping healthcare in Canada um, with the vision of whatever the World Economic Forum's vision for healthcare was. This is what I was up against. I was up against basically an internationally backed group. So I had no chance um, through the provincial uh, politicians really to make any kind of advancement because, you know, we had Premier Jason Kenney, who was a conservative politician, who, you know, he, he would take uh, the book of, of Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset and he said, look, look at these idiots and look at this garbage. And then they, they, they broke him so quickly that he was rolling out vaccines and vaccine passports and, and literally begging, begging at the altar of Pfizer and Moderna uh, just to keep his job. And, you know, then eventually it, you know, he got kicked out anyways. But, um, you know, I was I was up against really forces that were far more powerful than the politicians that were running running the province. So you know, you mentioned the WHO earlier as well, and you know, and, and obviously you're talking about a, 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 I will say cons you know a conspiracy, I guess is less is a, a, of a global scale. You know, when you're talking about World Economic Economic Forum, the 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 the, the WHO, you, and you're looking at at all of this, and you know, and I can't. You know, if, if I tell two people I'm going to fire a third person, uh, they're going to find out within three days. Like, I can't keep a secret, you know, more than anything. Yeah. And, 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 and yet we're looking at this. And so when I talk to people and I, and I, you know, that, that just kind of just your, your everyday person, one who doesn't necessarily read that just kind of goes through, you know, most of their news, they get off of social media or something, you know, they, they. Uh, it, it, it seems to be so large that it's that that it is incomprehensible to 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 see all this and understand this because again they're kind of experiencing the same thing. So it, 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 for me, it feels like there has to be somebody kind of at the top, somebody directing it, or do you kind of see it more as a conspiracy of just so many people are just taking advantage of it and recognize, okay, this over here, if they win, I win over here, and I could take advantage of it, and then and vice versa, and it's more of a more of a kind of a little section that kind of goes around and just linked, or do you think it's kind of more of a bureaucratic directed from a one or two, three people and move its way down? How do you, how do you see this experiencing it as long as you have and as deep as you are into it? I would imagine you have some insight in that. Yeah. You know, I actually don't really see it as, as much of a conspiracy because a lot of it is out in the open. Um, and, and, and a lot of these, um, 
bureaucrats will they'll admit that you know they're getting directives or they're consulting they're consulting the federal government or they're consulting their colleagues you know at the who and so on so so it's really it's not really like a oh there's a secret conspiracy and 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 they're going to do this but nobody knows about it because they're fairly open about a lot of these things and so i see it very much as um especially in canada and i don't know you know united states is very different than canada so whenever I speak, you know, I'm speaking about right. my, my experience with Canada. U.S. is structured completely differently. And what you have in Canada is you basically have 12 Californias, right? And 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 you you have, you know, 12 provinces. I'm not even going to mention the territories because that's irrelevant. I mean, they're so small and, you know, irrelevant. But you've got 12 provinces and, and the bureaucracy very, is very top down. And in fact... Medicine is very top down. Medicine is very hierarchical. And I think that's what most people don't realize. Most people don't realize that, you know, they'll go to their family doctor and they think their family doctor is independent, but they don't realize that that family doctor has to answer to somebody and that that person answers to somebody and that person. It's, it's a very pyramidal bureaucracy. And so um, healthcare is very easy to control in Canada. Very, very easy to control. Um you really, you know, you you have basically, you know, a dozen or two dozen people across the entire country in key positions who just collaborate and act in lockstep. And, and you know, they would have received probably certain instructions. And so what you end up with is you end up with, and this is what I want to stress, is that even though we had 12 individual provinces, we had a single response that was in lockstep across the entire country. And that doesn't happen unless there's coordination across the across the entire country. So and, and even in the United States, now you've got Florida going in one direction, you've got California going in the opposite direction, right? So you've got the Florida Surgeon General saying, hey, there's no evidence for the booster shots. Uh, we're not recommending the booster shots for anyone under 65. And you've got California saying, yeah, we're going to mandate these vaccines uh, for children to go to school, right? I mean, that's as opposite as responses as you can get. So in the United States, you know, you've got 50 different states. You've got a lot of uh, the individual states seem to have a lot of autonomy to do their own thing. <clears throat> we don't have that in Canada. And, and so the bureaucracy for the people to even get to that level where they can run a bureaucracy in, in the province, they have to already be loyal to the federal government. That's what I say is that the people at the top, it's like a club, right? It's like a club. You don't get led into the club unless, you know, you're all on the same page already. So you don't have to go and bribe individual public health officials, or you don't have to go and bribe individual leaders of, of the healthcare system or the individual deans of the university, because they're all friends and they're all part of the same country club. And they all made sure that they were on the same page before the pandemic hit. Um, and that's because Trudeau's been in power since 2015. And really, you know, if there were any troublemakers um, in those leadership positions, they were taken out, they were taken care of back in 2015 and 2016. So we really have a club of people that work together, their friends, their buddies. And they run the individual provincial healthcare systems, and so you know it's I I don't see it as you know as much of a conspiracy. You know you, you it's they they've said that they look to guidance from um, the chief medical officer of Canada from 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 Health Canada, which approved the vaccines again without any kind of long term studies, um, and so they look to guidance from the federal institutions, and then you know Trudeau will say openly that that he, um, you know he he looks to the WHO, the World Health Organization, and and so on. So I think it goes, you know the the directives or the recommendations go through kind of a bureaucratic chain of command, and it filters down to the provinces, and that's why we had a fairly uniform response, you know, throughout the entire country, even though we should have had. 12 different responses because we have 12 different provinces, right. but we didn't, it was very uniform. The hospital protocols were uniform, uh, putting people on rem remdesivir, you know, putting them on ventilators, uh, the, the blocking of ivermectin uniform across Canada. We don't have a single province where it's like, no, we're going to, we're going to allow ivermectin and we're going to make it over the counter. The Demas's family has been in the restaurant business for many generations. 
We have been serving people in the Middle Tennessee market for 34 years, and some of the recipes that we've had have garnered national attention. Some of these have been our award-winning banana pudding and our famous baked chicken and rice soup. When you're sick, you got cold or flu, there's nothing that make, that tastes better and that gives you almost kind of a healing component than our baked chicken and rice soup. So order some today at DemasFamilyKitchen.com and let my family be able to serve your family. I do want to talk to you about something else that I saw um, and, 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 and around you, and that was the, the word turbo cancer kept coming up. And I was like, okay, again, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a medical person. I'm not a science person, but I've, I'm fairly well read. I've never heard of turbo cancer. So I started looking up. First thing I did, and it was kind of interesting when I, when I Googled turbo, turbo cancer, and I just Googled turbo cancer. When I just Googled it, it was interesting. The first three things that came up don't have the word tur turbo cancer in it, you know, from the NIH, National Cancer Institute, the Cancer Research Institute, didn't happen. The first thing that actually used the word in quotes was a, was a LinkedIn, LinkedIn thing. And then all the stuff talking about how, you know, there, there's no evidence of COVID-19 vaccines causing turbo cancer. Wikipedia starts off by saying, it is an anti-vaccination myth centered on the idea that people vaccinated against COVID-19, da, 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 da. And, and so, so help me understand when we're using the term turbo cancer, it, that is not technically a medical term, right? Or, and then if, and then, so what is it exactly that, that like, where's that phrase come from? How does that, how does that work out? Turbo cancer is not a medical term, although, so here's the interesting part is that it is now starting to be used in the medical literature. There's uh, the first, I believe the first two papers that are in, uh, preprint that are under peer review that are using the term turbo cancer and using it seriously in the context of someone who's had at least one COVID-19 vaccine. Um, but the term arose originally, um, I'd say it, it arose on social media. I believe Dr. Charles Hoff from British Columbia might have been one of the first doctors to use that term. Uh, turbo cancer. Um, I might. I think. I believe. I've see, I saw him use it as a presentation in a presentation months ago. Uh, but you know, I, I actually don't know who came up with the term. It it, it arose on social media, um, and it was used initially by people whose family members were affected by an extremely aggressive cancer that arose shortly after COVID vaccination. Uh, usually, you know, a few months after COVID vaccination, uh, and. The behavior of these cancers is completely different. And so, you know, I first um, noticed this phenomenon because, again, like I don't go out looking for these things, really. I mean, I observe my environment and then, you know, I, I, I sort of, um, you know, react accordingly. And, and <clears throat> isn't that the basis of all science? Or should you would be think, <laughs> I mean, you would think it's maybe, maybe not anymore, but. Maybe that's a very antiquated uh, <laughs> approach, but um, stupid Galileo. <laughs> I know. So I first noticed the phenomenon of aggressive cancers in young vaccinated people, and this is how I would describe it: very aggressive cancers arising in young people who've had a COVID nineteen vaccine. I first noticed this phenomenon in Canadian doctors because I was I was tracking the sudden deaths of Canadian doctors since the end of twenty twenty one when um, I noticed that young Canadian doctors were collapsing or dying dying in their sleep um, just after taking their booster shot. And, and, and you know, that actually got me onto this whole idea of, of tracking sudden deaths. Um, you know, I'd seen athletes collapsing on the field throughout 2021. And of course, that was concerning. And Initially, I told my wife, I said, there's no way in hell we're getting uh, the COVID vaccines, no matter what, because uh, the technologies that they were using were failed cancer technologies that I'd known about years before, but I knew about them as failures. And and so the lipid nanoparticles, you know, they, they, they played around with lipid nanoparticles in the past. They were trying to load them with chemotherapy and use it as a vehicle for chemotherapy delivery, it had never worked. It had caused all kinds of problems when they tried to do it in end-stage cancer patients in the past. And of course, mRNA never worked. Um, they never cured anything. You know, they tried to use mRNA to maybe treat 
you know, people with certain kind of genetic anomalies or, you know, genes that they had knocked out. And, and, and again, that technology had never worked. So when, when I heard that they were going to use, I'm sorry. So yeah. when I've heard over and over again, well, MRN, MRNA has been around a long time and we've been doing this and that's why we are able to get it out so fast. It has been around a long time, but it just never worked for a long period of time. Is that it never worked? It never worked, period. Huh. And, and so, you know, it, it's something that was basically, you know, so, so I was doing cancer research as well. Right. And it was mRNA was something that was being kind of, you know, being kind of passed around. And, and every now and then someone would do some research about it and nothing would ever come of it. Nothing would ever come of the research. Uh, it was always a, a failed, it was considered a, a, a failed technology, but, you know, they were tinkering with it, right? And so when, when, when you mentioned this, that mRNA has been around for a long time, it has been around for a long time. They've been tinkering with it for a long time. They've never been able to make it work. And, and, and so when I heard that they were going to make vaccines and then push those vaccines on everybody using failed cancer technologies, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, what the hell's going on here? Right? Like, like. And then I thought, well, you know, and, and, and again, it's, you know, I've been very naive. And, and, and so the naive part of me thought, well, maybe they figured it out. You know, maybe they finally figured out the lipid nanoparticle issue or, or the mRNA issue. But I had like zero interest in the vaccine because I give experimental treatments to end stage cancer patients. That is who you give experimental drugs to is stage four cancer patients who have failed treatment. That's where you do your clinical trials with experimental drugs. You don't give a healthy person experimental drugs. Like, like that is complete insanity. You, you just don't do that in medicine, right? Like, like name me another example where we just give some, something purely experimental to a young, healthy person. Right. I, you give it to end-stage cancer patients. That's why I told my wife, I'm like, we are not even like, I'm not even gonna look at this. This is this is complete insanity. Of course, I did start looking into the technology, realizing that they actually hadn't figured out anything. Like they hadn't worked out any of the problems with the lipid nanoparticles and with the mRNA. And you know, people were collapsing and dying, sort of left and right athletes, and then doctors started collapsing and dying. And I started posting about it. I remember my first died suddenly post is on December 31st, 2021. And I'm alerting uh, Twitter to the fact that two Canadian doctors died suddenly within days or a couple of weeks after taking their booster shot and they died in their sleep and they were 48 years old and 52 years old, perfectly healthy young men, died in their sleep after taking a booster shot. And then I realized something's very wrong with these vaccines. And the more I looked into the vaccines and that's right around the time that the negative vaccine efficacy started coming out so people that and negative vaccine efficacy is the phenomenon that a vaccinated person gets infected more often than an unvaccinated person that came out in december of 2021 from denmark and the danish ministry of health and the, there was a danish study that came out talking about negative vaccine efficacy and so that was evidence of immune system damage and um there was a study of, of course, showing negative vaccine efficacy in kids. And so I started talking about, we can't roll out these vaccines in kids. And that's when I lost my Twitter account in March of 2022 is because I said, these vaccines have to be taken off the market. You cannot give them to kids because it's going to destroy their immune systems because there's already evidence in adults that it's damaging their immune systems because the hospitals are being filled with a double vaccinated. And, you know, 80 to 90% of people who are being hospitalized for COVID were double vaccinated. You know, and everyone kept saying, oh, base rate fallacy, Bell's rate, you know, base rate fallacy. If 80% of the population is vaccinated, of course, 80% of those hospitalized are going to be vaccinated. No, but they were disproportionately represented in the hospitalizations and deaths. Because that's when, when they rolled out the booster shots and then you saw the triple vaccinated started flooding the hospitals. You know, you had something like 30% of the population was triple vaccinated, but 60 or 70% of the hospitalized were triple vaccinated. So there was no base rate fallacy. This was destroying people's immune systems. Well, in the summer of 2022, there were three doctors in, in, in uh, Ontario, in a, one hospital in Mississauga, who died of cancer within days of each other. I think within three days, three doctors at the same hospital died of cancer. And mm -hmm. it was 36 years old, 49 years old, and, and the third one was in his 60s. That's when I first realized, okay, there's something 
more than just cardiac here. There's potentially a uh, cancer causing phenomenon here. And um, they died of, they basically had developed stage four cancer after two shots, after two vaccines and died in less than a year. And it's really maybe only just a coincidence that they died within days of each other um that made it a lot easier for me to notice and then start investigating the phenomenon and that's when i came across the term turbo cancer um and you know the more i studied it the more i realized there's an oncogenic process here that is happening in people who've been covid vaccinated that is completely different than cancers we've seen in the past and and it's it's so clear when you when you just keep your mind open to the possibility that the vaccines can cause cancer, right? Then, of course, the next question is, well, how are they causing cancer, right? But you have to start with an open mind. You have to start, okay, well, you know, vaccinated people are coming down with extremely aggressive cancers. Young people with cancers that we shouldn't be seeing in that age group are presenting not at stage one, they're presenting at stage four, and they're dead in six months. And that has never happened before. And if it has happened, it's something you see once in a career, not, you know, I shouldn't be able to go online and find 50 or 100 cases like this of something that should be a one in a million situation that happened, you know, in the past, like once in the once in your entire career, there's something happening, right? Um, and then you start to analyze clinically as a physician, I want to see clinically, well, what are the clinical features of this cancer? And, you know, I started calling it turbo cancer, because that was the term that was being used right. by people to describe it. Um, and, and it's, it's, um, you know, I, I think it's it's at, at first I didn't like the term because it, it's it's not a medical term, right? It's right. turbo cancer, right? It's like something, you know, out of a cartoon, right? But but again, it's it's kind of it has stuck. And I think people respond to it because they can understand what that means. They can understand that okay, this is a cancer that is turbocharged or that is like extremely aggressive, extremely rapid. Uh, the course is very rapid, uh, and so it's something that people understand very easily. And I think it's going to stick. I, I think turbo cancer, it's already starting to show up in the literature. Um, and, you know, give it another year, and there's going to be a dozen or two dozen papers talking about turbo cancer and mechanisms and so on. So, so it's, 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 it's coming. So when I look at, you know, when I looked at and started kind of looking at cancer numbers and I'm like, okay, I'm curious, particularly among younger people, because um, obviously you're, we're seeing a lot of the impact of people that shouldn't have myocarditis in younger people. So I figured that would be kind of the area to kind of, kind of look yeah. at. And, and it was interesting because, because there's not a lot of data after night or 2020 and, and I don't. You know, I'm not a, that that much of a the the you know of a, a thinker to say, oh well, they just shut it off. I'm just assuming that 2020 just they hadn't built up the da the the full data yet to get there. At least for my limited amount of research that I can pull up. But as I was looking at it, I, I, then I started seeing and 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 again, I just kind of noticed there's a whole lot of articles on like you know and just. Uh, mainstream media and other like Yale Medicine, you know, talks about why millennials and, and Gen Zers, you know, that, that that colorectal cancer is hitting people as young as 20. The next one, NBC News, that advanced colon cases are, are happening in younger people. Um, you know, National Cancer Institute, can colon cancer is rising among young adults. You know, ABC San Francisco is rising amongst 20 to 49 years. And I started seeing the headlines. And granted, that's not statistically significant. Granted, it's not. It's more anecdotal. But it just kept going and going and going. It sc I scrolled all the way past the first page. And I was like, okay, yeah, there may not be data out there, but this seems weird to me to, to see that. And again, it's that same thing I'm kind of observing. I just don't have the skills or, 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 or background like you do to be able to dig into it. Are you noticing it more in that younger population or does it just seem to be across the board or the younger population just an additional symptom of a greater problem? I do believe that it's across the board. Uh, I think, but, you know, if an 80-year-old person comes down with cancer, nobody notices. Nobody right. notices and nobody cares because they'll say, well, yeah, he's 80 years old. Even 60 years old, people will come down with turbo cancer. Nobody notices, nobody cares, right? And and so I focused, so the way I would say it is I have focused my attention on young people and there the numbers are abnormal. Um, and Canadian authorities are withholding cancer statistics 
Um, I've looked um, into uh, Statistics Canada and, you know, the, the Canadian Cancer Society. They are withholding that data. They're not releasing anything. And uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, same thing. They're withholding the data. And, you know, if they put anything out, like they'll put out an estimate and it's like it's in line with the previous years and so on. They'll, they'll massage the data long before anything gets gets released. They'll make sure that there is no spike. Um, but it's, it's very interesting. So when you when you talk about what you observe in the media, so what you have is is you know you have propaganda, but the propaganda has to at least somewhat match or reflect the real world. It can't be so like alien that people are like, yeah, obviously that's propaganda. The propaganda, successful propaganda, has to be believable. Right. Realistic. Right. And so on one hand, they, they have to say there's no link between vaccines and turbo cancer. It's all made up. Right. On the other hand, there are thousands of people coming down with cancers that shouldn't be coming down with cancers. And they're all over social media. They're all over Twitter. They're all over Facebook. There's Facebook groups. They're all over Telegram. So how do you reconcile this this issue? And uh, while well, you put out propaganda that says, oh, yeah, you know, there's increased cancer, but they try to normalize it. You know, and they try to normalize it by saying, well, you know, we there was a lot of missed screenings and there was a lot of canceled appointments. And, and now we're seeing the effects of that. Right. Or they might say, well, climate change. Right. Climate change is causing cancers in, in young people. Right. And they'll make up some bullshit, um, you know, um, cause. But um, it's, it's, it's a process of normalization. They want to normalize it so that by the time people start putting two and two together, it has already been normalized in the mainstream media. And they did this with 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 the myocarditis and the heart attacks in young people. And now you see uh, we see ads. We see ads for 12 year old kids having heart attacks. When have we seen that in the past? Right. Or 12 year old kids having strokes. And these are like well produced ads where, you know, they spent, you know, several million dollars producing these these beautiful crafted ads showing how normal it is for a 10, 11, 12 year old boy to have a heart attack, to have a cardiac arrest, uh, perfectly normal and, you know, or blood clots or, or strokes and so on. So so part of the propaganda is normalization of what's happening all around us and basically giving a different um, answer as to what is causing it so that people don't start asking questions and they, they, they don't start digging. But I think there's there's so much of it happening in terms of the cancers is that they don't quite know how to get ahead of it. And I get death threats when I talk about turbo cancer and I talk about cancers um, and the COVID vaccines causing cancer. And and it's the, the thing that I get attacked on the most is cancers and suicides, uh, suicides in the vaccinated. When I speak about those two topics, that's when I get almost all of my vicious attacks. I can talk about myocarditis. I can talk about blood clots until the cows come home. Nobody cares. They've kind of already admitted it. They say it's rare and it's mild and it's okay if you get a myocarditis and now you need a heart transplant because it's mild, um, right? Or you get a mild blood clot uh, or a stroke and that's okay. Like they've admitted that that happens, that the vaccine can do that. They haven't admitted um, uh, mental health impact of the vaccines and through like neurological injury, which could lead to increased risk of suicide in the vaccinated, and they haven't admitted cancer being caused by the vaccines. And so if I can give you just a quick two minute summary of turbo cancer, it would be it, it would be this. It would be in a person who's had at least one COVID vaccine, and it's predominantly an mRNA vaccine problem, although there will be the rare cases of AstraZeneca or J and J, but extremely rare. 99% of these cases are showing up with mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna equally. These are cancers that are showing up in young people, although I do believe it's it's across the entire age group, but they're very visible in young people because you get aggressive cancers in young people that shouldn't have those cancers. 20-year-olds shouldn't have breast cancer. 20 and 30-year-olds shouldn't have colon cancer. These are just two examples. Or 20-year-olds shouldn't have lung cancer for that matter, right? And they're presenting it usually at stage four, occasionally at stage three, but the vast majority of cases are already presenting at stage four. What a stage four means is means that the tumor has spread beyond a surgeon's ability to remove it and contain it. It has spread to either 
lymph nodes or distant locations like lung, bone, brain, and so on. The, the tumors grow very rapidly. They, they, grow, they grow much faster than oncologists expect that tumor to grow. So they'll, they'll grow rapidly to a big size. Uh, they, of course, they spread very aggressively, usually to multiple places. Uh, the surgeons are not able to contain these tumors. And if, if they are trying to contain the tumors or remove them, by contain, I mean to basically remove the primary tumor, they find out afterwards that the tumor has already spread. Um, the, these cancers don't respond to conventional chemotherapy or radiation therapy or even cutting-edge immunotherapy. This comes out of uh, people posting their uh, history, their treatment history on places like Twitter or like GoFundMe, where people are raising money because they've lost their job because they have to do chemotherapy treatments. And now they're telling us how their treatment is progressing. And they usually don't respond to chemo, radiation, or immunotherapy. If there's a response, it's a partial response. It lasts a very short time, maybe a month or two, a couple of months, and then the tumor starts growing again. Or there's no response at all, and the tumor just grows right through the chemo. So as the patient's getting chemo, the tumor, tumor just keeps growing. And the prognosis is extremely poor. Uh, for breast cancers, colon cancers, and lung cancers, the prognosis is 6 to 12 months. For the brain cancers, glioblastomas... It's maybe two, three months, up to six months. Um, for leukemias, it could be a matter of weeks, days, even hours. There's patients who literally die hours after diagnosis. There's really not even time to visit an oncologist and start chemotherapy because it, the progression is that rapid. And so, you know, that in a nutshell is 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 turbo cancer. All right, and we're kind of we're kind of coming closer to the end. So I want to ask this question because in, in my family, my the 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 younger people in my family, not um, either my children or my sister and my wife, we have we had one person that that got both shots. Loves getting the boosters. Like it, she she is she's like B twelve to her. Um, you know, then then uh, there there was two of us. Uh, I was I was one of them that didn't get any any part of the vaccine at all. Uh, one of us got one shot, got scared, decided not to get any more, didn't get the second one, and the other one just got the two shots and no boosters. So so I would imagine that there's many other places and people like this. So the people that got the two shots, so the people that got the boosters, and now they're hearing this, and they're like, oh my goodness, it's not like I can go back in time and, and fix it. What's your advice to them? Is there is there a way that you can see some of this quicker so that you could do it, be more aware of it or do more regular checks? What what's your advice to them so that they don't end up with these 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 quick results that come back on them? What what do you what do you suggest? Well, my first advice is is keep an open mind that these these vaccines can cause cancer uh, because I think where a lot of people are being led astray is that doctors don't want to admit that this is happening. They're basically saying this is a completely fabricated phenomenon. Even though there's literally thousands of people coming down with what I just described uh, and the behavior that I've just described, which is extremely atypical. As I said, for um, you know a young person to come down with a breast cancer in their 20s and it presents at stage four and it spreads rapidly and it kills them in a matter of six to 12 months, that should be like, I should see that once in my lifetime. And I can find you 50 or hundred cases now like this uh, without even, you know, searching very hard. Um, so these things that used to be virtually completely unheard of are now common. So, so keep an open mind that this can happen. No one knows the, the precise mechanism of turbo cancer. I, I gave Epoch Times a nine different potential mechanisms that have some basis in published literature, but everything is theoretical right now. We don't know exactly what's causing it. it there's obviously immune system damage. There's potentially genetic damage. Now, of course, the big topic is the DNA contamination of the vaccines which, you know, these DNA plasmids that shouldn't even be in the vials, but they're in every single vial as contamination of the manufacturing process. But no one knows um, the, the cause, the, under, the exact underlying cause, what's causing these cancers. And it is possible that there could be different mechanisms causing cancer in different people because we've administered billions of shots. And um, so there could be different mechanisms in play.
might not just be one mechanism. And because no one knows the underlying cause, no one knows how to treat them. And oncologists don't know how to treat them because they'll treat them conventionally and those treatments fail and they fail very quickly. So what I would advise to someone who's had the shot is to, to understand that you've been poisoned. You've been poisoned and you may have gotten lucky because you may have, may have gotten a mild version of the poison or you may have gotten a version of the poison that was non-functional to begin with, so you might be fine. Or you got poisoned with something that's going to show up, you know, months from now, years from now, and so on. Because, you know, we are still seeing the same side effect profile two years later, even though people have stopped taking booster shots for the most part. You know, booster uptake is down to 10%, and yet we're, st we're still seeing myocarditis, we're still seeing blood clots, right. we're, st we're still seeing autoimmune diseases and cancers arising in people who've had their last shot a year ago, year and a half ago, two years ago, which means that these vaccines have a long-term negative impact on your health. And we don't know how long that effect lasts. And so no one's in the clear. There's no safe period. It's not like, oh, I, I haven't had a side effect in two years. I'm in the clear. I'll never have a side effect. You might come down with a sudden death um, because a lot of the sudden deaths, there was no warning sign right. uh, that I've documented online. And so you have to be aware of the risk. You've been poisoned. You've took a shot or, or more shots. So you've been in effect poisoned. Now, what do you do with that? Right. So there's two approaches you can take. Um, you could take a reactive approach where you wait until you have symptoms, which I don't advise because, um, because of the nature of the sudden deaths. Um, and also the nature of the turbo cancer. Once you get the turbo cancer, it's extremely difficult to deal with. Uh, I advise a proactive approach. And what is a proactive approach to being poisoned? Well, you try to deal, you try to address the poison, um, which is the spike protein. And that's the thing that stays in the body, you know, the longest. Now, we don't know if the mRNA is integrating into our genome or not uh, and persisting, but theoretically, the mRNA is supposed to degrade uh, at some point but we are we are finding spike protein production over a long period of time, six months, twelve months, um, you know, and potentially longer. So you've got a. We know that the spike protein is showing up in tumors. We know that the spike protein is showing up in damaged heart tissue. It's showing up in damaged brain tissue. It's showing up in adrenal glands. It's showing up in the bone marrow. So you've got this foreign toxic protein, the spike protein that people are producing unknown quantities of for an unknown period of time. And so that is what people should address. Um, and, you know, you, you can address it. There's uh, supplements you can take that break down the spike protein, like natokinase, bromelain, serapeptase, lumbrokinase. Then there are supplements that block the spike protein and prevent it potentially from doing damage. Again, the extent of which we don't know. Uh, these are things like ivermectin, quercetin, um, olive leaf extract, black seed like Nigella sativa, curcumin, uh, dandelion root, uh, Artemisia annua. So these are things that have been proven at least in vitro and in some cases in vivo and like in animal studies to bind the spike protein and potentially mitigate some of the damage. Again, more studies need to be done on, on, on all of these things, but at least there's some evidence that they interact with the spike protein, potentially inactivating it or preventing it from doing damage. Then I highly recommend any, any kind of antioxidant because the spike protein seems to be causing a lot of oxidative damage, production of free radicals, reactive oxygen species. It damages the mitochondria. So you want an antioxidant like vitamin C you know, taking vitamin C on a regular basis or another powerful antioxidant is, is NAC, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, that seems to mitigate some of the damage, uh, especially some of the chronic inflammation that people have, like people with chronic lung in inflammation or chronic lung injury seem to find a lot of relief with NAC. Vitamin D is another key um, element of, of uh, supporting your immune system and getting your, you know, immune system... Um, to a level where it needs to be. Um, and high levels of vitamin D are actually protective against the development of certain cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, that has been shown. Hmm. We've seen vitamin D smeared by, by the public health authorities in, in Canada, United States, and, and vitamin D is actually incredible. There, there's, 
there's a lot of research showing that if we had just made sure that everyone's vitamin D levels were up, that we would have avoided probably 80 to 90% of the severe COVID cases and deaths. Uh, if we just made sure that everyone got, got you know, their vitamin D levels up to, to a certain level. And there is a cancer protective effect. And, you know, and then, of course, you know, diet and exercise. And in terms of diet, really uh, eliminating sugar from your diet because cancer thrives on on sugar and, and sugar metabolism. And, um, of course, exercise is, is always good for you. Again, you have to be careful because, you know, strenuous exercise after you've had the vaccines, right. you know, that can actually precipitate uh, some of these cardiac events. So you may want to have some kind of a cardiac workup done to make sure that you don't have a a myocarditis or something, uh, or, or right. some issues of the heart, you know, before you do strenuous exercise. So, you know, this is a kind of a basic approach, but, but it, it's, I would highly recommend a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach, uh, proactive approach to your health. And then you're, you're, you're basically reducing the risk. You know, we don't know how to eliminate the risk to zero. Um, and doctors will offer you nothing. Doctors will not offer you any of this. You know, doctors are there to basically see you when you've got your, you know, when you're presenting with your stage right. four cancer. And at that point, they really have nothing useful to offer you at that point. Well, I appreciate it. I, by the way, I, I did not realize I've been following Died Suddenly on Twitter for, for a long time. Absolutely love it. Didn't know that was you until you started talking about it. I um, absolutely love it. Send it, send it to a lot of people, a lot of the, the, the stuff there. So anyway, I think that's great. If there's anybody else that wants to find out more about this or more about you, where do they, where do they go? How do they, how do they find out about that? Certainly. So I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Um, my uh, Twitter account name is at MacusMD. M-A-K-I-S-M-D. And then I have a Substack account, um, macusmd.substack.com. And it's a very active account. I put out articles uh, on a daily basis. I put out videos. So um, this video is going to end up on my Substack uh, probably, you know, a week or two from now or, or um, whatever. And uh, I also put out, you know, very interesting video clips. Um, I have a sort of a basic subscription. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very affordable. It's $5 a month. Um, and it's just to keep the lights on and, and, and to keep the kids fed. And, and so I can continue doing this kind of work because again, you know, I I've had my, my license is still being held hostage. Um, I cannot make a medical income. And so, you know, I, but I still have two young kids I have to feed. So, um, so I appreciate, you know, when people support me through, through my Substack work. Well, again, thank you so much. I appreciate all you do. I appreciate you just standing up and just saying, no, I, uh, I think that's so important. I think more people need to do so. And, uh, I, I think it's the only way that we can change culture, which eventually changes the government and politicians above us. So, so again, I, I just thank you for for what you're doing. And there are a lot of people out there that do support you, that do support what you're doing. And I know there are mo those 2 a.m. moments where you feel like you're all alone, but 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 recognize there are people out there that do support you. So I do appreciate all that. And and I hope I get to talk with you again. This has been fascinating. I didn't even get to half of the stuff that I wanted to ask you about. So I hope we get to speak again. Absolutely. One thing I just wanted to uh, kind of just, I forgot to mention uh, in terms of, you know, addressing this risk of cancer and other other diseases is uh, I'm a big believer in fasting, but a, but a specific kind of fasting, which is uh, a three day, it has to be a three day water fast minimum uh, and a three day fast where you haven't eaten anything for 72 hours and you just drink water and maybe just, you know, have some electrolytes um, that seems to have tremendous benefits for the body. Um, it, it stimulates autophagy, which is the body's natural mechanism of clearing damaged cells uh, and getting rid of damaged cells, cells that might have been damaged by the spike protein, precancerous cells can be removed by the body. The body then tries to reboot the immune system. So it tries to produce new immune cells and immune system damage is, is really something that's we see in a lot of vaccinated people, and it manifests itself in many different ways. Immune, the damage to the immune system, whether it's autoimmune diseases, whether it's getting reinfected with COVID all the time, and eventually whether it's cancer, because it's the immune system that uh, conducts cancer surveillance and monitors for cancerous cells. And if you damage your immune system and you damage that surveillance, you know, you're basically vulnerable uh, to cancer. So um, I wanted to add that in, in approaching 
you know, the side effects and the injuries and, and potentially protecting yourself long term from something like cancer, regular fasting, three day fasting, whether you do it, uh, you know, once every couple of months or once every month uh, or maybe twice a month. It, it's a powerful tool that anyone has or everyone has. You don't have to buy any supplements. It's literally free. Um, and I, it, it, a lot of people are not aware of it. A lot of people are not aware of it. Of course, people in the health field are aware of the benefits of, of fasting, but I think the general population, many people are not aware. So I just wanted to throw that in before before uh, before closing. All right, I appreciate it. Well, again, thank you so much. And again, I look forward to talking to you again. I, I appreciate all you're doing. Thanks again for having me. After talking with Dr. Mackis, I wanted to touch on a couple points that, that I think is very important. You know, it was, uh, as, as I've said many times throughout the show, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a scientist. I did a lot of research on a lot of this stuff before I try to make a decision on what I needed to do. Um, and you know, ultimately, you know, I, I have a family that was very divided on the, the vaccine and the impact that it could have. And we, many of us went in different directions. And uh, some of us regret the decision, some of us are, are very comfortable with their decisions. And so I'm not here to sit there and say, well, this person's right, this person's wrong, etc. Because if you notice a big theme of what Dr. Mackis was saying is that there's just a lot of questions out there and there's a lot of things that we need to be looking at, a lot of things that's happening in our world that we need to observe. And then from those observations, we need to do studies. And it's concerning to me that we're not doing these studies, that we're not looking into it, even whether or not we can't prove causation until we do the studies, but there's definitely a correlation between what we're seeing with different types of medical illnesses and, and, and people and in areas that did not happen before 2020. Now, whether it is caused by environmental factors, whether it's caused by COVID or caused by the vaccine, also we will never know until we are able to do some studies on this and to, to, to prove it. Here's my question that I have for those out there who are very much that are against um, the, these type of, of, of studies that, that, are, that, are, that, that smear people for being anti-vaxxers or whatever the situation happens to be. Why, if you so strongly in it, why don't you allow people to do these studies so that you may be able to see that they're wrong? Now, or are you afraid that they're not wrong because some of these studies have already been made or you recognize the correlation is just too strong for you to be able to, to handle it? Now, again, I don't know. I am not an expert at it. I, 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 and I don't claim to be an expert at it. But I do know this. I do know that it's time that we need to be looking at certain things and saying we need to move forward. Now, that's not only true with the science sense. I think it's also true with societal sense. I think it's also true when we need to be looking at the suicide rates that might be increasing or this, this uh, or an increase of, of people who have um, you know, the, these other um, mental illnesses that are uh, coming um, and, you know, in relation to the rise of social media or in relation to the rise of, of, of lockdowns or whatever it is that you want to point your finger at. And again, it could be even environmental studies. I don't know. Again, I'm not a scientist in any of this and I'm not claiming to be that. I'm not claiming to understand it. But I think it's time that we need to be looking at things and saying we need to actually study it and find out where the truth is. Because the bottom line is, is there's truth somewhere listed in all of this. And until we seek it out, until we search it, then we can't find it. And lastly, we know that there is only one truth and that truth is the Word of God and that truth is the Bible. And so I tell you this is because as we continue to look at and we continue to look at things and the research may not be out there for, for, for lay people like us, but there is enough out there for us to try to make the determination, try to come, come up with our own and make the best decisions that, that we have that are in front of us. But we also need to make certain that we maintain an open mind with these type of, of problems that are out there because we don't want to get stuck with a confirmation bias and we don't want to get stuck thinking one way is the only way. So again, lastly is again, there's only one way, that way is through Jesus and I hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.